Okay. So I think we're going to get started because we have a lot of information to get to tonight. A lot of excellent information with some amazing, incredible um, speakers. So um, today's webinar is called Understanding the COVID-19 Vaccine. It's pretty straightforward. We're going to be going into a lot of details about the vaccine, um, the science behind it, um, how it was developed, and considerations for deciding if it's you know, the right choice for you. So next slide, please. I should also introduce myself. So my name is Emily Lamiska. Um, hopefully some of you recognize me from our other webinars. I am the Director of Communications and Educational Programming at US Pain Foundation. Um, so I'll be going through some housekeeping items just for a minute or two at the beginning. Then we will have our presentations um, followed by a Q&A. And we've already gotten a ton of questions submitted, um, probably some of the, the most questions we've ever gotten before a webinar. I think like 20 questions have been emailed in already. So we'll try to get to as many of those as we can, but we'll also obviously prioritize our um, live questions coming in on Zoom and on Facebook. Next slide, please. So again, questions will be taken at the end. Um, one thing I do wanna remind folks is that we cannot answer and our experts cannot answer highly specific medical questions. Um, so try to generalize your questions if you can. Um, to ask a question on Zoom, please type it into the Q&A icon or click on the Q&A icon and type it into the field there. If you type it into the chat, it might get lost in the conversation. If you're on Facebook, just type it into the comments and we'll try to get to it. Again, the chat is open, but please be respectful. Um, and if you have to jump off for any reason, all of our webinars are recorded and posted to uspainfoundation.org backslash pep talks. Um, we did just redesign our website. So I encourage you to check it out because um, there's a lot of great webinars and content there. Next slide, please. And another little reminder, so this webinar is educational only. Um, this information is not intended to replace your the advice of your medical provider. Um, you should always consult with him or her about your unique health situation. Um, and US Pain certainly does not endorse or recommend any specific treatment, therapy, or product. We just want to educate you about your options. Next slide. So we're very excited to have such an amazing team of speakers from the Pacific Northwest University of Health Sciences. And that includes um, Dr. Bilski, Dr. Taylor, and Dr. Randolph Habiker. So we are very excited to have them all here with us today. Um, Dr. Bilski is gonna be speaking first, then Dr. Randolph Habiker, and then Dr. Taylor. And so I'm gonna just introduce Dr. Bilski briefly, and then he'll in turn introduce our other speakers. Um, so Dr. Bilski is Provost, Chief Academic Officer, and Professor of Biomedical Sciences at Pacific Northwest University of Health Sciences. He is an expert in opioid pharmacology and early stage drug development, discovery and development, excuse me, collaborating with scientists around the world. Dr. Bilski first collaborated with U.S. Pain in 2016 when he was an integral part of hosting an advocacy summit at the University of New England, which is where I first met him. Um, he is now a member of our board of directors and an incredible one at that. Um, and we are so grateful to him for helping us put this webinar on and um, bringing this great um, team of speakers together. So with that, I'd like to invite Dr. Bilski to um, share his slides and come on screen. Hello. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, Nicole, for uh, allowing us to do this. Uh, I'm very uh, excited about it and welcome everybody. I'm going to start my screen show. And let's see. How's that looking? Is that uh, good? Yep, looks great. So I am uh, much more optimistic over the last couple of weeks than I was uh, at any time you know, since uh, about a year ago. And uh, I thought this picture kind of reflected you know, uh, that optimism. Uh, this is taken outside my house uh, two years ago, almost to the day, uh, looking out over the, the Cascade mountain ranges, uh, kind of in between Mount Rainier and Mount uh, Adams. And what's interesting is a colleague of mine took a very similar picture a couple days ago and posted on Facebook from his house. And I think what's happening is the uh, light is reflecting off of Mount St. Helens up into the cloud cover to kind of give you that, that column. So pretty cool time of the year to be in the Pacific Northwest. And again, a lot of optimism because it really was about a year ago, uh, I saw an article, we were tracking you know, the coronavirus and the impacts it might have, but this really kind of brought it you know, to a, a front for higher education that this was going to be impacting uh, both the semester and, and maybe beyond that. And 
So we, we formed a team very quickly uh, that really allowed us to go completely online for the spring semester. And then over the summer, we planned out a hybrid uh, model of uh, medical education. As you can imagine, uh, aspects of medical education require in-person uh, skills in the first and second years. And then by years three and four, we had to maintain you know, the clinical rotations. So uh, it's just an all out effort across the faculty and staff at Pacific Northwest University and the students too. The students were incredible in terms of their volunteerism throughout many phases of this, including uh, early education, um, then you know, the testing phases and now vaccine uh, with some of the uh, you know, super centers that were trying to vaccinate as many people as quickly as possible. So, uh, you know, it really gives us a chance to reflect on what this year has meant to all of us. For me, it's both professional and uh, personal for a number of reasons. I was about this time uh, in very early March in DC. This is basically the last week before they shut down. Uh, we were advocating for biomedical research and supporting NIH and others, you know, that really allow us to have the technologies and the discoveries that, that uh, allowed, you know, basically a vac set of vaccines to be developed so quickly, tested you know, fully, and then you know, starting to be delivered in less than a year's time. It is mind blowing, but that is based on all the research that goes in behind the scenes you know, over decades, as you'll learn from Drs. Habaker and Drs. Taylor. Um, right after that, I, I did a quick trip up to uh, see my mom. I'd lost my dad in January of uh, that year and she was uh, living uh, by herself in an assisted living facility. And it's kind of ironic, uh, March 8th was, you know, they were confirming in Western Massachusetts where I grew up, uh, the first kind of confirmed case of the coronavirus. And look at the little sticker on top of the Sunday Republicans, seniors don't worry. You know, that <laughs> there was a lot to worry about and, and continues to uh, worry about. And so that's my mom standing. She's uh, gonna be 94 on St. Patrick's Day. And uh, my 100-year-old aunt at the time, uh, who had just you know, recently moved into that same facility. Unfortunately, my aunt passed away because of COVID complications about a month later. So you know, this has uh, significantly impacted our, our family and extended families as we've uh, gone through this. I uh, quickly made it back to uh, Washington and uh, I was scheduled to give a set of rotary presentations on opioids, uh, but I used it also as an opportunity to just do some very early education on what we were trying to accomplish with some pretty low tech, but very effective ways of kind of reducing the spread of airborne you know, viruses such as COVID. And so this was uh, you know, kind of an all out effort, all of our you know, faculty and, and students who had expertise or willingness to do some education to the general public were doing so very early on uh, you know, to help out. I also use this as an opportunity to kind of emphasize uh, the importance of biomedical research funding. Uh, this is kind of a follow up to the DC trip and uh, I kind of highlighted both uh, the challenges that chronic pain uh, people have in, uh, you know, just under normal circumstances and what we were anticipating was going to be a major disruption in terms of healthcare uh, for, you know, the foreseeable future at this point, but also the importance of investing in you know, the research that leads to these, uh, you know, groundbreaking uh, advancements. You know, the U.S. Pain Foundation is very important to uh, who I am and, uh, you know, it, the uh, work that uh, I do uh, as both a board member and as an advocate and as a, you know, a scientist educator. Uh, we were able to quickly uh, work with one of my former colleagues, Megan May at the University of New England to provide, uh, you know, timely information back in April on how best to navigate this. We, we were seeing at the time that there was some you know, changes in legislation and rules and procedures and how we could manage uh, people, particularly you know, people who with chronic conditions need medications, need to be able to access their physicians, need to get prescription refills. It wasn't perfect, but there was some accommodations that were made on the fly to try to address some of these challenges. We continue to do that work too and uh, advancing you know, areas such as telehealth and access to uh, care for rural and underserved populations. PNW has done a lot and, and Kim and Julie uh, are front and center of this along with our continuing education office. We're doing a lot of uh, continuing education both for providers and the general public 
through this community connection series. It started in the fall, it's extended, and uh, Kim and Julie are both uh, presenting uh, this semester on, the, on COVID and uh, the vaccine. Uh, I was able to do some work with a, a colleague at the University of Bridgeport. We were both May Day fellows that uh, advocate for uh, chronic pain, better access to care. And uh, so I was hosted at the University of Bridgeport and again, front and center talking about how we're navigating this now in the fall with the vaccine imminent. We are also extending some of our work uh, with a colleague, Anita Quintana, who's very active in the Hispanic Latino community of Central Washington in a partnership with Radio Cadena, doing an all Spanish uh, program format uh, so that we could get information out to you know, various uh, populations uh, throughout our uh, Pacific Northwest. My mom, during all this, you know, she and uh, my dad both uh, have had uh, chronic pain, for my mom, since the 1980s. And it's been a challenge. We were working with her physicians, both her pain specialist and with her uh, primary care physician. Uh, her knee was flaring up. She's got osteoarthritis, among other things. And uh, the question was, should she get a steroid injection during COVID? And that was an open question that, you know, there's no definitive answer to that. But weighing all the risks and benefits and in consultation with both the primary care and the pain specialist, my mom decided to go ahead and get the injection that gave her some relief. And uh, during the fall semester, they kind of relaxed some of the uh, requirements. We finally started to be able to get to visit her again. Uh, you know, just imagine the social isolation that's occurring. You know, you may be experiencing this firsthand and that impact that has on your mental health. So my son was able to help her uh, vote in late October and take her to an outdoor dining. Just look at the smile on her face. You know, earlier in the summer, it was always masked. You could see she was dejected and it was seeming like things were returning back to normal. Things took a turn for the worst in terms of, you know, the uh, ramp up around the holiday seasons. They had to, you know, lock down the facility again. And, um, you know, that, that's been an ongoing challenge. Uh, this is, I don't want to steal Nicole's thunder, but just did an op-ed for telemedicine uh, in the midst of chaos we learn sometimes and maybe uh, can apply some of the things that we've learned going forward uh, with opportunities for enhanced care and enhanced access to that uh, care. So this is gonna be coming out in an invisible project, I think within the next month. So again, just one of the many things US Pain Foundation is doing to help its membership. And I, you know, I have to say that I'm so excited that my mom's now received both vaccine doses. Uh, she got the Pfizer vaccine. Things are gonna return back to normal with visits on March 6th for the facility. And my two sons who are working or going to school remotely in Western Massachusetts are gonna be able to see her uh, whenever they want uh, inside and outside. So this is you know, very good news, but there's still plenty of work to be done. And that's part of the reason for this seminar. And I'm just really excited you know, to have two experts at PNW who are guiding a lot of our policies and procedures and how to deliver medical education safely and how to be ambassadors to the public. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, first uh, Dr. Julie uh, Randolph Habaker, and then Dr. Kim Taylor is going to go after her. They're going to give you a lot of information on understanding uh, the vaccine, the, the technology and science behind it, how it was tested, and uh, the differences between the various vaccines that are available. So with that, uh, Julie, would you uh, be able to take it over? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm ready for my first slide whenever uh, you'd like to reshare. So thanks everyone for inviting uh, for inviting us into your into your group. This is um, we're excited to get uh, positive messaging out um, and to help educate people on what's happening as far as the vaccines. So just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a pathologist. Um, I have some, I did some work in my graduate work in viruses and I spent several years at Fred Hutchinson Research Center uh, in, in Seattle doing some work with vaccines. So I have a little bit of background there. Uh, so my first slide, please. So I'm just gonna take a few minutes to review what the virus looks like, important structures of the virus, the immune response that's generated from getting infected with the virus and how that will relate to a vaccine. We'll talk a little bit about the vaccine platforms and then I'll hand it off to Dr. Taylor who will go into much more detail. So as you know, uh, 
COVID-19 is caused by a virus called Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, which is really long, so we'll just say SARS-CoV-2. And so SARS-CoV-2 causes coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19. We like to shorten things, right? So SARS-CoV-2 is related to SARS and MERS, which you heard about uh, several years ago that caused respiratory tract infections and, and uh, pulmonary failure outbreaks that started in China and, and Saudi Arabia, uh, respectively. These viruses are all have something in common and that they're called beta coronaviruses. So they're distributed uh, throughout humans and other mammals. And I have a picture over here. This is this uh, electron uh, micrograph of the virus. And you can see headed off of the this, what we call an envelope here, um, are all these spikes. Spikes come off the outer surface that look like a crown. So that's how coronaviruses get their name. Next slide, please. So if we look at a diagram of that, in the blue, uh, this blue ring, that is that, that capsid um, or that, that uh, outer covering, it looks a lot like the cells that uh, they infect. And then importantly are these green proteins here, these spike proteins. So this is the virus spike protein and you've probably heard a lot about this in the news, right? Because this is the protein that helps the virus infect the host cells. So this spike protein for SARS-CoV-2, it interacts with a cell protein on the host. So in, in your body, uh, that's called angiotensin converting enzyme two or ACE2. <laughs> so ACE2 has a wide distribution throughout the body. And when you hear where it's, where it's expressed in the body, it makes sense when you think about the disease. So ACE2 is expressed on cells in the lungs and the esophagus. It's also expressed in the nasal pharyngeal area. It's expressed in the intestines. So that's why we, we see a lot of in gastrointestinal issues with, with COVID. It's also expressed in the liver, in the heart, in the kidneys, and in the bladder. So I'm sure people have heard a lot about heart problems that people have or kidney problems that they develop. And that's because of either directly being infected by the virus or other issues that the virus causes. So we're gonna focus on, on really the spike protein. So next slide, please. All right, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about what the virus does when it gets into the body and the immune response that it, that it makes. So that way you understand then why we did certain things or why they did certain things when they made the vaccines. Okay, so here we have our coronavirus up here at the top. It's gonna enter the body. And when, again, when it comes into contact with certain cells, those cells that are expressing the ACE2 receptor, the spike protein will engage with that ACE2 receptor. It'll form a complex. And then lots of stuff happens, but basically the virus enters the cell. And when it does that, then it's free to allow its, its genome, its uh, genetic material to go out into the cell where then the cell's machinery starts to replicate that virus. So it, it uses the virus's genome to make all the proteins that the virus needs and the virus is assembled and then it can go out and the virus is released. So next slide, please. So this is the meat of what we're gonna talk about. So once the virus is released and it's it's out, uh, out of the cell, the virus can be ingested by these specialized cells in the immune system called antigen presenting cells. So these antigen presenting cells, their job is to chop up foreign proteins and then it presents them, it, it takes them in little pieces and puts them on cell surface. By doing that, it can then engage with other cells of the immune system. So for example, it can engage with a cell that we call the T helper cell. So T helper cell gets activated, realizes that there's a, there's a virus here. And in this case, 
it can activate then two parts of our immune system. It can activate the B cell, which starts making antibodies. And that's what these little Y-like proteins are. So these proteins that this B cell starts making in abundance can be secreted. They go, they go out and then when they engage with the virus, they bind and hopefully they bind to things like the spike protein. And so now the spike protein can't engage with the cell receptor, the ACE receptor. So this kind of gloms up the virus and now the virus can't infect another cell. Likewise, there's another arm of the immune system that gets activated, these cytotoxic T cells. So these cytotoxic T cells will then go out and they'll look for cells that are, that are infected with the virus that are actively making new virus and it will kill them. So it basically kills then the, the virus factory. So the great thing about our immune system is now those cells, after it's cleared the virus, after it's cleared the infection, they can then be memory cells. So a subset of those will go on and they'll live for months to years. And that way, if you're challenged again, or if you're infected again with that virus, they will, there won't be any downtime. They'll jump right into action, hopefully, and they'll clear the next, the next infection. Uh, advance, please. So we're learning a lot about this innate or this immune response to SARS, to SARS-CoV-2. We know that people make protect, protective antibodies, but they, those can wane over time. The time, we're not sure, right? We're still gaining, right? This is a new novel virus. We're still gaining a lot of information. We do know from SARS-CoV-1 that B cell immunity can last two to three years and that T cell immunity can last about 11 years. Unfortunately, uh, the, the coronaviruses that cause the common cold, they don't produce an immune response that cross reacts with, with uh, COVID-19. Next slide, please. So why do we vaccinate people? Really the crux of it is we want to reduce morbidity, so illness, we want to reduce mortality or death. And we want to, you know, we want to get rid of this economic disruption, right? We want people to get back into their communities. We want people to get back uh, to work. We want our kids to go back to school, all those things. So the hope is that we'll be able to produce immunity and prevent uh, severe disease without a person needing to get sick first. So this is a way to stimulate the host immune response. So what a vaccine does is it, it just kicks your immune response into gear. And so I have this graph over here on the right and on the bottom is time. And uh, over here on the left is how much of an immune response. So for the two vaccines that we're gonna start talking about, the Pfizer and Moderna, they take two shots. And so the first shot, you start to mount an immune response and that's that primary immune response. And over time, that'll go down a little bit. And so we give a second shot. And so that second shot boosts the immune response back up. And hopefully that will induce even more of that memory response. Now, we'll talk a little bit about the differences, but for the J&J &J vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it's made differently. So it's, and it was tested differently. So it looks like it only needs one shot. Uh, next slide, please. Another purpose uh, for vaccination, we've heard a lot about in the news is herd immunity, or I like to say community immunity because it just rhymes and it sounds nice. Um, and this is a way to generate a high vaccination rate in the population for two reasons. We wanna protect ourselves, but we also want to protect those who are unable to get vaccines or are unable to respond well to a vaccine. So people like newborns, uh, people with chronic illnesses, people who might be allergic to the vaccine components and can't get the vaccine, or people who even when they get the vaccine, their immune system just isn't working well enough for them to mount a good immune response. Now, we don't know how many people necessarily in our communities need to be infected, or sorry, need to be immunized in order to get uh, 
community immunity. So we use uh, lots of different measures. Um, one, for example, is an r naught, and people may have heard of r naughts before. And an r naught is just, what is the average number of people that an infected person goes on to infect? So next, uh, next advance, please. So we know the r naught and how many people need to be immunized for a couple of other diseases. So measles, for example, is really contagious. So one person can go on to infect 12 to 18 people. So we know from that that we need about 94% of our population to be immunized. Polio, we know about five to seven people get infected per person. So it needs to be about 80 to, to 86. COVID-19, we're really not sure what the r naught is. Um, as you know, we've, we've been seeing different, different strains come out that are a little bit more virulent. Um, and so we're trying to pin that number down. We think it might be between 1.5 and 3.5, not sure yet. And so we're, we're using other viruses as a model to think maybe between 70 and 85% um, of the community needs to be immunized. But that number is always changing. So you'll hear from myself and you'll hear from Dr. Taylor that it's really hard to pin things down right now because the data is changing, not just weekly, but daily and hourly. Next slide, please. So a lot of people are questioning, you know, how did we get here so fast? You know, this is unprecedented. The, the fastest vaccine for a disease previous to this was four years. For, for mumps. So how did we get here so fast? I'm just gonna go through a couple of these very quickly. First of all, we identified what the virus was very quickly. And when I say we, I don't mean we, I mean other people. Other people did this. So after SARS, uh, the, the Chinese scientists uh, upped their disease surveillance and they were able to quickly identify that something was happening they were, they had the scientific uh, knowledge as well as the facilities to identify what the etiological agent was or what the virus was. They were able to sequence it very quickly and then they shared that sequence with the world. Because it was related to a couple other viruses that we'd seen before, we had a pretty good idea what those targets, what good targets would be for vaccines, so the spike protein. A whole host of new technology is now available. Computing, right? We were able to sequence things so much faster. You know, when I think about how long it took uh, 12 years for the Human Genome Project and cost, you know, a billion dollars. Now we can do that. We can sequence a human genome in about a day for about $2,000, right? So it's actually cheaper than an MRI. Um, there's a huge number of vaccines that are in the pipeline. And also we've made advances in those vaccine platforms. Another great thing that happened was we threw a lot of money and a lot of resources at this, right? So uh, uh, governments, foundations, Dolly Parton, you know, a lot of people donated a lot of money to get things moving. And people that have experience in vaccines quickly moved to, over to COVID-19 to get this, this up and running. And then even the processing. So as we've seen just recently, Johnson & Johnson and Merck are competitors, right? Well, now they formed an alliance and they're working together on manufacturing processes to get vaccines out faster. And then also we're using a compressed clinical trial process. Compressed doesn't mean that, we've, uh, that we're doing anything different as far as monitoring safety. But what it means is that some of the phases are overlapping. So for example, usually we would do a phase three trial, the big trials with you know, tens of thousands of people, and then we would analyze the data, and then we would start to ramp up production of the vaccines. But now we're doing that and so at the same time. So when a, vi when a vaccine hits phase three trials, they start ramping up production of that vaccine. Now, if it doesn't pass, uh, safety standards, the same safety standards that we've always used, then we discard that vaccine. But if it goes through all the rigorous and, 
and Dr. Taylor will talk about this, all the rigorous uh, science review, you know, literally Johnson and Johnson was uh, approved on Friday. I know an acquaintance who got the Johnson and Johnson vaccine on Monday. So incredible. All right, next slide, please. So there's two platforms that we're going to talk about today and, and different ways to make vaccines. The first is the mRNA vaccine platform, and this is what Moderna and Pfizer use. Really, there's a lot of advantages to this. The vaccine isn't infectious. It can't cause you to get COVID. It can't cause you to get uh, SARS-CoV-2. The material that we're giving you will not integrate into your genome. It can't mutate your cells. This little piece of, of RNA that we'll talk about here in a minute, um, once it's in the cell and it's done its job, it will be degraded by normal cellular processes. These vaccines are really easy to make in the laboratory that gave us, um, us again, I keep saying us, them, <laughs> um, a way to make these rapidly, inexpensively, and then scale the manufacturing up. Also a misconception is that this is a very new technology. Um, I guess in the scheme of scientific uh, study, it's, it's new, but really we've been working with RNA vaccines since 1990. The reason that we're able to use them now is that very recently, I, I'm familiar with them because we've, we've used them at, uh, when I was at Fred Hutchinson to look at tumor vaccines. We've been able to use them now more because of that work and that work going into them where mRNA, because of its structure is very unstable. In, We've been able to work on the stability of that and also a better way to deliver that to cells. Next slide, please. All right, so a little, uh, a little back up into what RNA is. So you're familiar with DNA. So DNA is the storage, the instructions for all the proteins in your body. And that is housed in the nucleus. So you can think about this, this uh, DNA as a book and your, um, your nucleus is the library. So when a protein needs to be made, there's a process called transcription. And a little piece of that DNA is now transcribed. So it's copied and it, it kind of acts like the software. So that little piece of mRNA, messenger RNA, comes out of the nucleus, right? We're not gonna let you check the whole book out, just a part of it. So that comes out of the nucleus and then it interacts with a protein called the ribosome. And the ribosome's job is to then translate that, that mRNA into a protein. So once that protein is made, depending on what its structure or job is, it will go wherever it needs to go. Next slide, please. So this is how we can use mRNA as the vaccine. So we can take a piece of the, of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, different pieces of it. We can take the RNA that codes for that. So the instructions that tell us how to make, tell the cell how to make that. And we can put it in this lipid coat. And this, is, this was the big secret. So now this lipid coat, it keeps that little piece of our mRNA from degrading. Because normally it would, if it's outside of the cell, things would chop it up. So that little lipid coat can now fuse with your cells once it's injected. So this is, it's being injected. This lipid coat comes up to a cell. Now the RNA is in the cytoplasm. It never goes to the nucleus. So it never comes near your DNA. And now your, your cell starts to make viral proteins. In this case, it's making that viral spike protein. So the spike protein gets taken up by this antigen presenting cell. So that should sound familiar, right? So that antigen presenting cell is gonna start to then put that on its surface and it's gonna activate that immune response. So it's gonna, end, it's gonna activate T cells and B cells. So B cells will make antibodies, 
and then cytotoxic T cells will be able to go and kill virally infected cells. Next slide, please. The Johnson & Johnson is a different platform. So this is an adenovirus vector. And so we're able to make an adenovirus, um, and this is an, a, not, a, not a natural occurring adenovirus, this is an adenovirus that we made in the lab from a naturally occurring adenovirus. But this time now, this, this virus that normally would cause things like a cold, now it can't divide, it can't replicate. So it's also non-infectious. It can't give you a cold. It can't give you COVID. And it's not going to replicate on its own. These are also easy to make in the lab. They're very stable. So again, we're able to ship this, uh, these without all the precautions that we need for the other two. And because it's the outside of it still a virus, it will induce a robust immune response, right? So that might be why we only need one shot of this. This is not new either. These, uh, um, this technology was first introduced in 1974. I worked with these quite a bit uh, with colleagues at Fred Hutchinson in trying to develop HIV vaccines. And so all that work, again, working up these for other, other viruses and other diseases, we've recently overcome some really important challenges. All right. So I believe that is my last slide. So I will, oh, nope, I've got one more, sorry. <laughs> um, again, uh, this is our adenovirus. So it looks a little bit like coronavirus, but its structure is different. And this time, instead of, instead of the adenovirus DNA in here, nucleic acids, we've now put a little bit of that coronavirus spike protein. So we put that in a syringe, we inject that as well. It doesn't even have to go into the cell. It's picked up by those antigen presenting cells. Again, the spike protein is now chopped up and presented and we can mount an immune response that way. Okay, now I'm sure that's my last slide. So I'm gonna hand it off to Dr. Kim Taylor. Okay. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Habecker, and thank you, everyone. It is a pleasure to speak with you this evening. Um, I'm not a physician, and at the heart of my professional life, I always try to supply resources to whoever I speak to about science, and, and, and that is really important because I, at the baseline, view myself as a science educator. Uh, I read through um, the questions that were submitted on, ahead of time, and unfortunately, I can't answer quite a few of them, partially because we might not yet have an answer, uh, but also partially because I'm not a physician, but more importantly, I'm not your physician. So my goal in this part of the presentation is to present you with as much as we do know at this point and provide reference to content for you to use, for you to think through things uh, for yourselves and discuss with the people in your lives. Um, I think it's also in, uh, an especially important approach related to topics of the pandemic, since we all on a global worldwide scale are on a steep learning curve. And as we learn more every day in this pandemic, the best available evidence changes. Uh, it's important to emphasize, um, of course, that this presentation does not serve as medical advice. So please consult your physicians on any questions concerning your health. But I, I'd also like to say, speaking of the professionals that serve us in our lives, our entire healthcare personnel, our scientists, our public health officials, our clinical trial participants, thank you. Um, thank you out there for your selflessness, for stepping up to the plate um, a very full plate and for your dedication to staying up to date on what has been a dynamic year in medicine around the world as we've all worked together in service to lead us to dealing with this emerging pathogen. So next slide, please. I'm going to pick up where Dr. Habecker left off first by looking at more information about the COVID-19 vaccines, including national and global vaccination numbers or epidemiology and a review of the resources you can use for COVID-19 vaccine safety and effectiveness from both clinical trials and from current administration levels in our community. Um, we'll then take a couple of minutes to double back on some of the virology of the SARS-CoV-2 virus as we talk a little about the new variants that are being discussed. And finally, I would like to leave you with resources that you will most like, you're, you're probably already most likely familiar with, but I feel are examples of places to follow the science as it applies to our lives. 
Next slide, please. This has been a year of how did this happen? How can we respond to get through it? And, and we've had so many questions. We haven't been able to do the things in society that we've been used to doing, and um, at least in the way we've been used to doing them. And we've been faced with risk mitigation and risk decisions that we weren't generally in our personal lives and communities well poised for this time of last year. Um, we've had to learn what is the best evidence um, best evidence-based way to take care of ourselves and each other as we actually build a plane we're in while in flight in that plane. Um, we also have found ourselves having to be patient with science. Good science takes time and it changes. And I, I think we've been in such an incredible place as Dr., uh, both Dr. Zbilski and Habecker said with basic science research after the over the past two to three decades, especially as it relates to the molecular and infectious disease nature of the topic that we are all dealing with in society right now, that we had our ducks lined up. We had a foundation of basic science knowledge that was ready to be deployed and translated into clinical scenarios and answers when this virus emerged. And if this sounds like I'm a plug for going into science, it does, it is. That's, I'm definitely giving that plug. We need scientists. Um, there has been groundbreaking cooperation on a global scale between medical experts, companies, and governments. The speed of development of vaccines was discussed by Dr. Habecker with this, uh, with a, a part of this due to sharing research on a scale that's never before been attempted. Here in the United States alone, every phase of every trial has been carefully reviewed by both FDA and non-FDA safety boards and committees uh, with dozens, hundreds of people actually on each of those committees. Uh, even with basic science research poised for this time frame. Clinical trials could not be possible without participants. Um, so that was a huge shout out at the beginning for all of everyone who's participated in a trial. And we don't have participants for validation of a trial unless we have the pathogen. So we had things lined up and we needed, it, everything just kind of came together then. Um, our mission at PNWU is to be community focused. It's to train physicians to practice in rural and underserved areas. And as such, we have a very strong teaching focus at PNWU. Um, this teaching focus requires me to stay current in numerous areas in microbiology and bring that content literature and evidence-based findings into the classroom. I can personally attest to the fact that the basic science knowledge and infrastructure has been poised for quite a period of time now and in a way that we really did have our foundations ready to respond when this emerging pathogen took center stage at the end of 2019. Um, about 15 months ago, Nature supplied the pathogen, and since that time, we've been supplying and honing our ability to support each other and in a multidisciplinary approach, validate our ability to work together to collectively solve a problem. Next slide, please. On this slide, you see the current status of the problem in the United States. As of earlier today, March 4th, 2021, there are almost 29 and a half million known cases uh, and 531,715 known deaths from COVID-19. Last week, we unfortunately arrived at documenting at least a half a million deaths due to SARS-CoV-2 infection in the United States. The data I share is taken from Worldometers. Um, this is a site that I've used since January of 2020 when SARS-CoV-2 first came to my attention. And at that time, the pathogen had not yet been given a name, but we knew it was a coronavirus based on genetic sequencing, as Dr. Habecker went over, um, from the first patient specimens. Uh, we refer to it as a novel coronavirus, which novel means new. I've continued to regularly use the Worldometer site just for data consistency. However, other fantastic data tracking sites have been there all along, including the Johns Hopkins University site and the CDC COVID-19 tracking pages. Both of those resources can be seen in the text box on the bottom of this slide. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, seen here is the current status of COVID-19 vaccine doses delivered within the United States, as well as how many of those have actually made it into arms. Uh, more than 80 million doses have been administered, which is more than two and a half times the number of known infection, infections in the United States. Uh, that's a good feeling. Ultimately, uh, the different data points on this slide translate into a little more than 8% of the people in the United States receiving both doses. Uh, and I expect this number to begin to change drastically over the next couple of weeks as the Janssen vaccine uh, subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson is distributing this week in the United States. For example, my, in my state, Washington state, we, are, um, we were scheduled to receive almost 61,000 doses of the Janssen vaccine this week. Uh, next slide, please. 
as uh, as I reference over time, the two graphs seen here compare the total number of doses delivered February 18th versus today. Uh, we have made incredible progress. Next slide, please. On a global scale, as, uh, as of earlier today, March 4th, 2021, the world has seen almost 116 million confirmed cases and we have lost at least 2 million 575,143 members of our human family. Again, since I've used world uh since the beginning of, and actually before this being declared a pandemic, this data is from that source. And again, the Johns Hopkins dashboard is a great resource as is the World Health Organization for this data. Next slide, please. Uh, with regard to the status of global vaccination rates against COVID-19, according to Our World in Data, we've administered almost 276 million vaccine doses of one of the, I believe there are 12 vaccines that are currently approved by at least one country. Um, according to the World Health Organization, there are currently 76 vaccines in clinical development and 182 in preclinical development. Next slide, please. It's coming there. It's slowly coming. Um, so we are now going to move into some additional vaccine production and authorization details, including what we know from clinical trials through phase three, considered the trust trial, emergency use authorization, and the data we are getting from vaccine administration in the community. Frame that review, I think we've we need to briefly just move through a few definitions. Vaccine efficacy refers to the proportionate reduction in cases among vaccinated persons. The term is relative to a controlled setting such as in a clinical trial. When you start to hear about how well the vaccine is working to control disease in a general population, you will hear, hear the term vaccine effectiveness. Um, this has the same definition, but it's relative to uncontrolled settings. Next slide, please. Immunogenicity refers to the ability to stimulate an immune response. We wanna see good immunogenicity profiles uh, from the clinical trials when it comes to neutralizing antibodies, which are the antibodies that act to specifically inhibit the virus's pathogenicity, and T cells for some of the long-term immunological memory functions of the vaccine. This goes back to Dr. Habecker's portion of the presentation. Uh, reactogenicity refers to the ability to produce expected and what are typically considered common adverse reactions. They are frequently strong immunological reactions, such as the sore arm at the site of injection, fever, et cetera. And these are telling you that the vaccine is working and that you also might be on a good path to start a good immunogenicity profile. Next slide, please. And finally, the term platform. Uh, Dr. Habecker went through the basis of the vaccines we are currently using in the United States, and she covered the platform topic really well. Um, when I think of a vaccines platform, I think, for example, of, you know, as it being like mRNA vaccine or a viral vectored vaccine, I think of this as being like one of our smartphones operating systems, such as Android or Apple's iOS platforms, uh, to accomplish our human communication efforts. Vaccines use different platforms to accomplish our immune system communication. Next slide, please. As of today, we have three vaccines in use um, in America under the FDA's Emergency Use Authorization, EUA, two using the mRNA platform and one using the viral vector platform. The Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, or VERB PAC, to the FDA was presented with the voting question at each of the EUA hearings. And that question relative to the clinical trial data that was presented was phrased as, quote, based on the totality of scientific evidence available, do the benefits of this vaccine, fill in the specific name of that vaccine, outweigh its risks for use in individuals, fill in the specific age data, which is 18 and over for Moderna and Janssen, or 16 years of age or over for Pfizer-BioNTech. For all three vaccines, the advisory committee voted yes, uh, FDA took Burback's advisory vote uh, with all of the review they had independently produced, and the weekend immediately adjacent to those seven to nine hour hearings for each of the vaccine presentations granted an EUA. Next slide, please. Thank you. I just presented uh, on, on the previous slide, the endpoint result of each of the vaccines. That is 
the granting of an EUA. But if you want to visit uh, the FDA page referenced on this slide, you'll be able to take a closer look at the path for a COVID-19 vaccine from research to EUA. Um, you'll notice that the path starts in the upper left-hand corner of this graphic uh, with a vaccine manufacturer conducting research to develop a vaccine candidate. That's an appropriate place to start with the intent of describing this pathway, but leading up to that first step on this path was dozens of other basic science steps in research that for the COVID-19 vaccine topic has evolved you know, just piece after piece after piece over the last three to four decades so that we were poised for step one on this graphic in science and medicine when our species would need it. A case in point is that we have learned so much from HIV research, as Dr. Habecker said, that we could apply to our emergent response over this past year. Next slide, please. Okay, this graphic from the CDC is not a COVID vaccine infographic, but I like to use it in teaching because I think it really drives home how much work every single year goes into developing a new annual flu shot. Um, more than 1 million patient specimens from positive flu tests are surveyed. And after enormous coordination and work by those labs around the country, we end up with approximately 50 strains of flu virus that could be included in the upcoming season's vaccine. It is obviously a tremendous effort that is repeated year after year. And it is these types of foundations and structural procedure and molecular knowledge that have allowed us to be ready for what we have seen in response this past year. Next slide, please. I put together uh, this table that, to show a comparative overview from clinical trial data of the three COVID vaccines currently being used in the United States in our fight against this virus. All three vaccines are administered intramuscularly, which is what the IM stands for in the administration column. Um, the immunogenicity data presented to the FDA for all three produced a good immune response profile providing protection from the viral challenge and the production of neutralizing antibodies and appropriate T cell responses. The mRNA vaccines have two doses associated with their administration with Pfizer-BioNTech having a three week span between doses and Moderna having a one month time span between doses. In contrast, the Janssen vaccine is a one dose immunization. Uh, I know there is discussion in the media and in the public regarding the efficacy differences and which one you should take, but I think the two important points in this conversation are that, number one, these studies were different in design and across different areas of the world, so some of the intercomparison doesn't roll out that easily. What is important is that they have been shown to be safe and effective with tens of millions immunized, um, tens of millions of people immunized um, as of today. The second main point is that all three have shown 100% efficacy against hospitalization or death within their individual clinical trials. Uh, the links at the bottom of this slide show you where you can go if you would like to read the materials from or actually watch the recordings of the EUA advisory panel hearings. The proceedings were live streamed on December 10th and 17th for Pfizer and Moderna respectively, and this last Friday, February 26th for Janssen. Um, I attended each of the live streams, which were around nine hours for each in December, and last Friday came in at a little under eight hours. Um, I know that I can be a bit of a science nerd, so for me it was great fun, but these hearings um, really are so incredibly informative for processing knowledge on our own that I highly recommend watching them if you can. Um, for any upcoming EUA applications from other vaccine developers, you can search for the meeting page at the FDA when the meeting announces an app or when the media announces an application has been submitted. And then you can find out when the hearing will be so you can attend if you're interested. Next slide, please. So, um, that was the uh, clinical trial review for the three COVID vaccines in the US, but now we are more than a couple of months into vaccinating and we are starting to get population level information on effectiveness and safety. The next couple of slides will give you just an overview of some of these findings. At the end of January, Nature News produced a publication looking at vaccine effectiveness data out of Israel, stating that, quote, in a preliminary analysis of 200,000 people older than 60 who received the vaccine, compared with a matched group of 200,000 who did not, researchers found that the chances of testing positive for the virus were 33% lower two weeks after the first injection." Unquote. 
The last week, uh, or excuse me, last week, two more studies uh, also out of Israel showed vaccination uh, being be, vaccinations being effective for a wide range of COVID-19 related outcomes with findings consistent with those in the randomized trials. Um, this can be seen in the New England Journal publication second on this list. And in the third reference is a study published in CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report or MMWR, which by the way, I truly recommend you take a moment to get a free subscription to, uh, great resource. Uh, and this is showing da data um, um, with vaccination positively influencing some of the more severe outcomes of a COVID di diagnosis, such as mechanical ventilation. Next slide, please. Safety information. Uh, I think it should be, yep, there it is. Safety information post authorization continues to be updated and reported on. Last week, the MMWR reported that, quote, after administration of 13.8 million doses of Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna COVID 19 vaccines to the US population during the first month of vaccination program. So that was. December 14th through January 13th. The post authorization profiles for both vaccines are reassuring, close quote. Uh, rare anaphylactic cases have been reported and epidemiology of that reaction for each of the mRNA vaccines has been continuously updated. As a publication from, um, or as, uh, let's see, as of a publication from, I think it was around two weeks ago, yep. Uh, the rate of anaphylaxis in the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is listed at 4.7 cases per million doses administered, and in the Moderna vaccine is 2.5 cases per million doses administered. Um, there are also rare anaphylactic events associated with immunizations against other microbes. For example, uh, the flu shot has a rate of 1.3 cases of anaphylaxis per million doses administered. I would direct you to uh, the complete and most up-to-date presentation on vaccine safety data that I have seen from the February 26, 2021, so just the end of last week, update by the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases. Uh, this involved, last Friday, as I said, involved not only a presentation of all known data to the verb pack, uh, but I would also encourage you to maybe flip through those presentation slides uh, because they are also really, they really nicely go through how safety data is collected and evaluated. Um, and speaking of collecting safety data, I just want to reinforce the value of registering with vSafe. Uh, you'll find the vSafe reference on your COVID immunization card. Um, and in addition to uh, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, also known as VAERS, um, that's been around for about the last 30 years, vSafe was specifically designed by the CDC for COVID vaccines as a smartphone-based uh, post-vaccination health checker that allows for text messaging setup and web survey completion. Next slide, please. And this should bring us to our last topic of the variants that are now being detected. Um, as, I, as, as we think about variants, we should frame our thought process about the topic I think from just a, a basic science virology standpoint, with a perspective that viruses are nature's machine learning. Their goal is to try combinations to figure out how to best infect a living cell and figure out how to induce the most favorable environment for reproducing themselves. That's the whole show. Um, they are known as obligately intracellular parasites, um, not parasites as in worms, but just a microbe that is living at the expense of its host. Uh, so they have to be in a living host cell to reproduce. It's not that that it's the virus's goal to kill us because from their perspective, if, if they had one, um, they, they need living host cells. They are never static and they are always changing themselves, evolving and picking the genes that give them um, the selectively best shot at achieving this goal. Um, business as usual for a SARS-CoV-2 virus involves accumulating a mutation about every two to four weeks, which is about half the rate of influenza's mutation rate and about a quarter of the rate of HIV's mutation rate. So other viruses are mutating much quicker. Um, we are gaining in vitro information on escape mutants or what could be considered an escape mutant from current vaccines and, are, and, and we're responding to study that further. And just like Dr. Habecker said, we. I'm not personally doing that, but the scientific community overall is doing that. 
As can be seen in the February 24th Moderna press release, they have sent a new mRNA vaccine candidate to the NIH um, to begin studying it against the B1351 strain that originated in South Africa and has now been discovered in, as of two days ago, um, 65 cases in America. And I, I think the word discovered is also important to frame this discussion since there are most likely strains that have already been in circulation um, that we haven't identified until the last few months. As we increase our genomic surveillance, we'll probably discover additional strain information. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this goes through what our current uh, um, what our current statuses of SARS-CoV-2 variants in uh, for as far as our genomic surveillance goes. Um, the top of this list is uh, relative to the, you can see the B117 strain. Uh, that is what initially came out of the UK last fall. Um, and it has been predicted that that's what's going to be the, um, uh, the most prevalent strain in the United States uh, later this spring, you know, probably by mid spring. Uh, so this just kind of gives you a standard update as well as some resources to be able to kind of track yourself where some of the um, uh, variant status is at. Okay, and uh, next slide, please. Uh, suggested resources, okay. Um, the resources on this slide are really important to me to communicate to you because they will give you a a durable, regularly updated list after this presentation to follow the information um, that is, you know, so characteristically ever changing on this topic. Um, second on the list, you will see there is a new resource that came out this past week from the Ad Council, the COVID Collaborative, and the CDC. They they jointly produced this um, resource. It is at vac getvaccineanswers.org, um, and I would recommend taking a look at it. There are also other great resources that can help us work through solutions to address this problem. At the bottom of this list, you'll notice a link to the World Health Organization's page. Um, I point this out just because they have been producing live streamed press conferences, usually a couple of times a week. Um, they've become a regular part of my life and have been very valuable to my education. Um, and of course, if you can't watch the live stream, it's captured for viewing later. Next slide, please. Um, the last resource I would like to leave you with is the CDC's Interim Clinical Considerations for Use of COVID-19 Vaccines currently authorized in the United States. This will provide you um, with answers to many of the questions you have about vaccine administration guidelines, and I believe cover many of the questions that I saw submitted um, prior to this evening. I've been very serious um, in preparing this presentation about not stating what the current recommendations are because this recording will live on and will be potentially reviewed or potentially shared. And while that's usually a great thing and sharing is exactly what we all need to be doing, um, some of the information in this recording can easily be outdated almost immediately. Uh, this has happened to me many times this past year as I write a, a weekly science update for our university's coronavirus advisory group. There have been times when I have emailed my update and need to send a new version maybe less than one hour later based on a change. Um, and, and actually for this document, if I had sent my presentation to Emily and Nicole yesterday, I would not have had the most updated recommendations from this link that you see today because they came out sometime between yesterday morning and this morning. Um, if we can look at the page together for just a moment, uh, you will have a view of the type of guidance you can make a note of for when you need to discuss this with your physicians. Um, I think it should link out Okay, um, we'll see. And if it doesn't, that's okay, because I know we've... We also just typed it into the chat if people wanna Perfect. click on it there and explore. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Uh, let's just go, yeah, let's just go with that then. If that's, yeah, we'll just do that. Um, but it really, it goes over, uh, you know, really um, thoughts you should be having before you uh, get your vaccine. Um, how to respond um, with what the latest um, taking pain medication, just NSAIDs, uh, 
you know, antipyretics, et cetera, after your vaccination. Uh, it goes through what some of the questions are about autoimmune or immune compromised disorders. Uh, and it really, it, it really is very, very well updated. So I highly recommend that you, you know, take a look at it. Um, use this page, just bookmark it so that it does auto update for you and you have um, those resources at your fingertips. When someone has a question um, or you're going to talk to your doctor, um, very important. Um, lastly, I, I would like to emphasize for my portion of the presentation that I truly believe it's important to follow the science on this emerging infectious disease. Um, our, our, we, I have always been so proud to be a part of PNWU, but over this past year, uh, as, as Dr. Bilski referenced, um, our senior administration responded immediately to putting together, um, a, you know, just a, as I mentioned, the coronavirus advisory group. And, you know, have, have, we've just regularly updated the group with whoever has that expert opinion to bring to the table. And uh, our senior administration has really put science first in, in following what the data says, as ever changing as it is. And so I, I feel this is really especially important for a couple of elements of our lives and our humanness existing together on this planet. Um, my main thought here is that I believe we are hardwired to plan. Uh, I think that's a human characteristic. We see this in every bit of our lives and how we use clocks and how we've orchestrated our concept of time how we use schedules and how we even do things like eating and meal schedules and dosing schedules for our medications or supplements that we take. And as a species, we love to plan. And when we can't, I think it really throws us for a loop. Um, when we can't see a path out of something or plan actions over time to achieve a goal, it's truly frustrating. And those are some of the frustrations we've all had over the course of the pandemic amongst others, including risk analysis. So we can use science to inform our risk analysis. But when we are making personal decisions that require benefit to risk decisions, we need to understand the data the best we can for ourselves. Um, I saw the spirit of learning in the questions that you submitted and it, it made my heart jump for joy because I think the vast majority of science we learn in our life, we learn outside of the classroom. And it's my hope that this presentation has added to your learning and that you do leave with resources that you can continue to learn from and in support of following the evolution of the knowledge we're working to acquire through this. Um, next slide, please. And uh, I, I don't believe the vaccines are too good to be true. Uh, as Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it is done. Next slide, please. And in closing, on behalf of Dr. Edward Bilski, Dr. Julie randolph Habecker, and myself, I'd like to thank you for attending this evening. And of course, thank you to the U.S. Pain Foundation for our invitation to share. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so um, informative. And I feel like a little mini scientist, like <laughs> I've learned um, so much about the different, different variants. So um, we'll see. We'll see um, if other people feel the same, but we've had a lot of great questions, like you mentioned, Dr. Taylor, um, that came in before the webinar, and then folks have been asking questions in the Q&A, um, which Dr. Bilski has been also trying to type in some answers to. Um, and just a reminder, if you are on Facebook, just type, a, type your question into the comments and we'll try to get to those as well. Um, and of course, a reminder too about the fact that we can't really answer really specific medical questions. Um, so for example, you might, instead of asking like, I have lupus, should I personally get the vaccine? You might ask like, I have an autoimmune condition. What should I know about getting the vaccine? Um, so keep the questions coming in and we'll see how many we can get to, but let's see what we have right now. Um, a couple that have come in are about, of course, the different um, types of vaccines. Um, and um, someone named Ellie was asking if it might make sense to get multiple vaccines, like if that would help cover multiple variants, which I thought was an interesting question. I'm not sure who wants to tackle that one. I can start and then Dr. Habecker, you can back back up if you'd like. So first of all, no, now this is not, um, th there is no recommendation to get multiple vaccines. And uh, I think it a, a really important thing to remember is when I said in vitro, um, we have in vitro information on this, we don't actually have any in vivo information that these vaccines are having any type of reduced um, in, you know, efficacy, reduced neutralization. Um, 
you, you know, we're not seeing that 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 hit on the vaccines actually. We don't have data for that in person. So to say that this is a, a real phenomenon in actually in humans would be inaccurate at this point. Um, what goes on in a in a you know in a petri dish or a test tube testing the vaccines against variants is very very different than of course in the whole human system. Um, so. The companies, I know, I know all of the companies are preparing for this. And you know, I showed you the Moderna press release. I know Pfizer's doing the same thing. Um, I have no doubt that Janssen and Johnson and Johnson are on it as well, as far as uh, you know, saying we better be thinking about this, and and we're going to come up with some new formulations here. Uh, but there's no evidence that this is actually uh, that there is reduced neutralization from these vaccines yet. Okay. Um, and sort of along those lines, um, Candy was asking whether, like, so, so will one vaccine be effective against multiple strains, hopefully? Hopefully. <laughs> I wish I had a really solid answer on this. Um, so when, when Pfizer and Moderna began their clinical trials, uh, the predominant strain, and it's still at this point, the predominant strain is you keep hearing about the G strain. Um, and that G strain was the D614G. And when you can, this is this alphabet soup of letters and numbers that are going on. And, and I know that the World Health Organization was going to meet with worldwide labs about two weeks ago uh, to be able to standardize this naming system so that we don't end up with 20 C VOC 2021 B5 351 so that we actually have. Um, but labs that are doing the genomic surveillance and that are tests that are, are really looking at the strains, there's this B lineage or, um, you know, there's a, they put it into genomic lineages. Um, and then lines off of those genomic lineages, which is what those ones and sevens mean. When you start seeing things like D614G, and we say, oh, it was the G strain, what those, or now we're talking about our N501Y or um, our, you know, our E484K, um, I think it is. Yeah. Uh, is it? E? Yeah. E484K. What the E's and the K's and the D's and G's, what those stand for are amino acid codes. Um, so when we think amino acids, you put them together, like Dr. Habecker said, um, you know, the, you have this mRNA code, and in your normal cellular just to make a process to make um, the, the collagen and the elastin and the protein that's in your skin and, and hair, um, you're making proteins that have a primary structure of amino acid sequences. And if you change any amino acid in that sequence, you just change the protein. Um, you know, it just it completely changes the function of the protein. And that's what those letters are meaning. They're saying, okay, this is, we went from a D amino acid and what the codes are of our 20 essential amino acids are not incredibly important to our conversation. We could have a whole protein lecture here, but um, we went from one amino acid to another amino acid at that site, that 614 site, um, you know, because there's a, a line of them. This, this is a 30 kilo base, um, uh, which means it has 30,000, it's a very large virus actually for viruses, but 30,000 um, uh, you know, uh, uh, genome. And so you get to like 614, which is in that spike protein range and it replaced a amino acid. So we got a G strain and that was really the predominant strain and that's um, last spring. And really it's still the predominant strain but the B117 is considered to be um, coming up as the predominant strain, which has very different amino acid um, mutations that are going on. Uh, we're seeing that N501 to Y. Uh, so that means that there was an, an, the N is an amino acid code and the Y is an amino acid code. And now we've got a different amino acid at the 501 site. The same with the, the um, E484K. And so we're trading out these amino acids uh, and ending up with a, you know, a slightly different protein. And we're seeing a lot of these emerge at the same time around the world. Um, it's, it's known as convergent evolution, basically. Uh, there, you know, it, so it must be giving the virus a selective advantage, maybe allowing it to attach to cells greater, maybe allowing it to uh, you know, be more transmissible because we do know that B117 uh, you know, is 40 to 50% more transmissible. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean that you take your R0, by the way, and then just add 40 to 50% onto it. So it doesn't mean you take your 2.5 to 3.5 R0, 
the effective transmission rate, you know, average number of people you can transmit this to, and just ramp it up by 40 to 50 percent. Um, it was looking that 40 to 50 percent more effective data came out of UK um, when when they were realizing that that the R naught which really is not completely an R-naught anymore because you don't have an immunologically naive population. It's an effective transmission rate at that point. So it's an R sub E, uh, was really circulating in those, in those neighborhoods um, that they first discovered this at about 1.1, about an R-naught of 1.1. Um, if you can get your effective transmission rate below one, you've got to, you're, you're gonna, it, the pathogen's gonna die out. Um, so it was about a 1.1. And when this B117 strain came along, um, variant came along, it it became a 1.5. So they saw an increase from 1.1 to 1.5. Uh, you know, but the the vaccines were initially tested against the G strain um, in the United States because that's what was circulating in the in the you know in the country. Um, but it's it's not below the you know we have not seen below limits at which we expect the vaccines to work. Uh, and you know, as we said, the messenger RNA vaccines. Are incredibly flexible. Um, we know that. Um, we know Janssen is also, you know, responding and knows to be. Everybody's looking for how they can change their formulation pretty quickly. And then, you know, the the distribution, the production and distribution is kind of a little bit of a different story. It's going to be, you know, you've got to go through that whole distribution process again, like we have thus far. So that's where the time element is. But I really do think that when we start looking at all of these individual strains. Um, we have not seen, you know, a decrease in effectiveness yet. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, and sort of along the lines, like another question that we've gotten from a few different people um, is about transmission um, post-vaccine and folks wondering about, um, you know, sort of what our current knowledge is about how likely it is to pass on, you know, be a carrier of COVID, even though you yourself are protected and vaccinated. Um, so I was wondering if someone could speak just a little bit to that. Um, Dr. Bilski or Dr. Randolph um, Habecker, I don't know if you guys wanna tackle that one. Sure. Um, the, the, the short answer is we don't know yet, right? So, so the, we're gaining more and more data um, you know, that when the vaccines were developed, they were really developed not to stop someone from getting infected, but they were really developed to reduce the amount of disease that someone would have. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's a little bit like influenza. So uh, the influenza vaccine, um, you might still get the flu, but you won't get it as bad. But that does mean that if you do have the flu, you need to stay away from the rest of your family that might not be vaccinated for, for a while. So that's why we're still recommending that, that people wear masks, that they still social distance um, until we really get a handle on, you know, does, does this keep people from spreading the virus? Probably not. Um, so we do still, that's why they're, they're telling us that we're still going to have to wear some masks until as Dr. Taylor said, the more people that we get vaccinated, the, the more the numbers, the number of people getting actively infected will go down. And so then we won't have that very active spread. So um, unfortunately, uh, it looks like you still could get infected, but at a much low, you know, safer level, if I can say that, you're, you're not going to necessarily get a be on a ventilator or, or die from the disease, um, but you could potentially still pass pass the virus. Can you can any of you speak to sort of like how long you think we might be needing to wear masks um, given like vaccine rollout? Like could it be like another year, another two years? Um, you know, I know that's been sort of a question on people's minds as well. Is it just too hard to predict? You all look sort of like. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, no, too, too difficult. <laughs> like you could pick a lottery number. Uh, yeah. that was a winner more easily. I threw, I threw away all my lipstick, right? Cause I just don't know. <laughs> you know, um, I, I know that the CDC is coming out with guidelines sometime this week. I was hoping it would be out today. I didn't see it yet. And so if somebody else said, please tell me that I missed it this afternoon, um, of what we can and cannot do once we're vaccinated. Um, so it was supposed to be as early as maybe today. 
Uh, so just kind of watch for that uh, because, you know, those guidelines are taking, I mean, they're, they're literally just scanning, they're putting every bit of evidence that we have so far and um, putting it into red light, green light, you know, yellow light type things mm. that um, are good right. public health advice. Right. Okay. So I'm just going to, oh yeah, go ahead. Let me just quickly comment. Yeah. One of the things we know we, we have been doing more of is washing our hands and avoiding eye contact with our fingers. So that's something we should all remember going forward. And, you know, one of the uh, upsides of all this has been that the seasonal flu has been almost non-existent in the United States. So it, it shows again, the, the general effectiveness of mask wearing hygiene, uh, you know, around these things uh, that, that help protect us. And it's really going to depend also on the, the specific individual and their risk factors too, even when they're vaccinated on their ability to do various uh, low tech strategies to just you know, protect themselves. Um, there is a really good question in the Q and A open box. And uh, you know, that, that could be a good question for either doctors Taylor or Habaker. Uh, it's about the evidence patterns being observed for adverse reactions to the vaccines. What are we learning from all the uh, vaccines that have been given so far in the post surveillance? Great question. So, uh, you know, I, I think something that is um, interesting as far as uh, uh, the data that we're gathering uh, is that uh, you know, I, I remember there being a study back between uh, when Pfizer first rolled out and the first doses were given December 14th. Uh, so between, I think it was December 14th and December 23rd, uh, we had a study that showed that the rate of anaphylaxis, for example, was 11.1 um, cases per million. And that's because we had, you know, that's just where we were at with our gross number of, you know, vaccine rollouts. But then, as I said, during my part of the presentation, we're at 4.7 cases per million for, for Pfizer. So, I mean, from 11.1 to, um, to, you know, to 4.7, um, we're just learning so much more about the data. Uh, you know, most of the adverse and Please jump in, Dr. Habecker. Most of the adverse reactions um, are what was expected, what came out of clinical trials. Um, but I, I really cannot emphasize enough, make sure to use VAERS, um, you know, tell your friends and your family, use the VAERS site, use the VSAFE site. Uh, it's, it's really important to be collecting all of this. Uh, you know, VAERS cannot, uh, it's not designed to uh, produce causality. And uh, so, you know, be really careful with different things that, you know, that you read that just, I see so many things that drop down on my phone and so many of them are really helpful. But I also, you know, I, I know a little bit about how those systems are designed. I'm not an expert and I don't work there and I don't, I haven't developed them and designed them on, but I, I know that they're, it's a hypothesis generating system and we're going to learn more and be able to hypothesize what we should be prepared for in adverse reactions. Uh, and, and then I, I think I also heard at one of our, my national webinars, I don't know if it was, a, I really don't remember what the, what the topic was, but uh, that, you know, you might have adverse reactions because these are producing good immunological profiles. And we really need to re-market, I think, our immuno, immunology thought process that when you have a fever and you have myalgia and you have chills and you have, maybe, you know, you, that's your immune system saying, Hey, I, I don't like this and I'm responding to it. And you're building that immune response. And I, I think that's a very positive thing. And I did hear in that one of those national meetings that if you're having your emergency department be vaccinated, don't have everybody in the emergency department be vaccinated at the same time, because you need people there for shifts 12 hours later and 24 hours later. And there could be um, immunological expected reactions that would be uh, uh, maybe up to, you know, 24 to 48 hours, the next couple of days, maybe expect to stay home and take care of yourself. That is, yeah, great information. Um, and that sort of brings me to this last question that I want to get to, because I see that we are um, we're having some people who are, it's late over here in the East Coast. So i um, trying to be mindful of time and um, fortunately, Dr. Bilski typed answers into a lot of the specific questions. But something that I've heard from um, patients sort of um, repeatedly because 
you know, obviously people who come to our organization have chronic pain. Um, they have a lot of different perhaps comorbidities. Um, and a lot of folks are have questions about, um, you know, whether they should be getting the vaccine specifically with having certain autoimmune conditions. Um, and, and this one question was sort of worded specifically, so I'm going to read it um, to, for you. But the person asked, um, the CDC has a list of 13 pathologies that puts a person at risk for severe disease if they're infected with COVID. Um, my condition is on that list. However, I was told by two medical doctors that no one with my condition was able to participate in the trials for the vaccines. Um, so they're wondering if I am at high risk for severe disease, if I get infected, am I justified in being afraid that I might have a higher chance of experiencing adverse effects from taking the vaccine since there is no data about you know, my specific condition? Um, so I wonder who wants to touch on that for me. Yeah, Dr. That's a, yeah, yeah that, that's a tricky one. Um, so because you're at higher risk for uh, more severe disease from COVID doesn't necessarily mean that you'll have a higher rate of adverse effects from the vaccine. Mm -hmm. But that said, we don't know, right? And, and you're absolutely right. We haven't included, you know, for instance, um, in some of the trials, uh, we haven't looked at, you know, compromised people yet, we've looked at a subset of, of people that had well-controlled HIV, for example. Um, you know, we haven't looked at, at kids yet. Now those trials are going on. So we're, we're getting our kiddos in there so we can, we can see how they're doing. So, you know, the, the, the short answer is we just, we don't know yet. I mean, again, that's a really, I think, you know, your body, your, your physician knows your disease course, um, and I think that's going to be a really important conversation to have with your physician. In the meantime, though, it does mean if you're on that list that, yeah, you need to keep up with the masking, with the social distancing, because again, as our communities, as that those numbers go down, um, then there'll be that community immunity that will help, you know, if you can't get the vaccine because of your condition, that'll help you be able to then, you know, return to, to the community. And one of the things to think about too, you know, we've been talking about in the United States, it's also really, really important that we support other countries being able to have access to vaccines. You know, not only is it because, yes, because we're, we're global citizens and we're part of this global community, it's the right thing to do, but also because, you know, if we think about areas where there's a lot of virus still circulating, we can get more in different strains that are coming out. So, you know, when, when you hear about, yeah, we need vaccine rollout in our communities, absolutely. It, you know, Yakima, we've had some stumbles with that, you know, so, so getting my 80 year old mother vaccinated was a challenge, but, but we also need to think about this as a global issue. You know, this is a pandemic not just happening here. So, you know, the quicker we can roll those vaccines out to other countries and, and, lower resource areas, the better off our whole community will be. Great hey, answer. Emily? Yep. Can I also add, uh, there's two other, I think, important questions uh, that if, just briefly, the adverse reactions, uh, not just the 15 minute wait period, but what's called phase four post-marketing surveillance. Once a drug and the vaccine's approved, there is a database that captures, you know, potentially any set of adverse effects that occur between the time of the vaccination and going forward for you know, as long as the drugs on the market. Um, it, you know, again, you have to rule in or out the causality of any particular symptom that someone might experience spontaneously versus linked specifically, but they, they do maintain this database and try to look for any early warning signs as something goes from tens of thousands of people to you know, millions or hundreds of millions of people. Um, the other question, uh, Patrick uh, asks a good question, uh, and it's it's controversial, obviously. I'm just going to give you my perspective being somewhat neutral in, in all this. Uh, the CDC, they're human beings just like all of us. Um, unfortunately, politics gets wrapped into science and health uh, in, in many different ways. And so, you know, as a society, we tend to oscillate in extremes, and the amplitude is too extreme on either end. So we sometimes see these knee-jerk reactions, you know, going back to another extreme, whether it's over or under prescribing 
or in the case you know vaccines you know we've, we've seen some of the back and forth that, that goes on with guidelines i would say that the cdc is still the very best in the world at what it does which is to try to attempt to monitor human health and provide the best guidance with the evidence that's available but they are you know um, impacted by the politics and can make mistakes too but in, in this case with the vaccines i think you know the, the guidance coming out right now is is very good uh, they're doing the best job that they can with incomplete data sets and rapidly changing conditions um, and there's also the peer-reviewed literature independent scientists you know at universities um, that are trying to you know confirm public health experts uh, you know looking at these same data sets and, and making recommendations so we're, we're all doing the best we can Thank you, Dr. Bilski. I think that's a great place for us to kind of um, end on because it's, you know, as Dr. Taylor, um, you know, expressed and emphasized multiple times, all of this information is evolving. Um, by the time we post this webinar on our website, um, you know, some some pieces of it could be outdated. So, you know, everything we all have to kind of just be patient and have an open mind and um, try to stay as informed as possible. Um, that said, I think there's a lot of excellent information in here that should be relevant, even as certain little things change. So I would encourage you to share this, you know, with family and friends for those of you who are still um, tuning in today. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much to the three of you for um, speaking with us. And we're getting a ton of comments in the chat, which I hope you're seeing uh, with people saying um, thank you for sharing your expertise, um, because I know it's 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 really hard. Um, and, you know, I was an English major, so maybe I have a harder time than, than the average person, uh, but sort of understanding all the science and just feeling more comfortable and more informed about making a decision. And I think too, you know, the bottom line is always, you know, talk to your doctor. Everyone is different. Everyone has different considerations and different situations. So um, just be as informed as possible and speak to your specific medical provider about what's what's best for you. Um, so thank you guys again. I really appreciate it so much. And we will have this webinar posted on our website within just a couple days. Um, I did want to say um, thanks to our corporate council who sponsors our pep talk webinar series. And we host webinars on almost a, a roughly a monthly basis on different topics. And this is probably maybe our fifth webinar on something COVID related, um, but certainly in in my opinion, one of the most interesting. Um, so I really appreciate your time here tonight. So um, last slide, please. So again, thanks to everyone for joining us, especially our speakers, because I know you, you put so much time into those slides and they were just so interesting and thorough and fantastic. Um, so folks, I really hope that you can maybe share this webinar recording once it's up on our website. And again, that's uspainfoundation.org backslash pep talks. And that's also where you can find all of our webinars um, from over the past several years. And we hope that you will check those out. So thank you again um, and stay safe, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank Have you.